my apologies. I uh, I was just talking for a couple of minutes and realized that I had not turned on my microphone. <laughs> so, uh, Sarah, should we start the recording and start again? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the week week four session of writing Wikipedia articles. My apologies for the late start. I just tried to start and realized that I had not turned my microphone on. <laughs> so anyway, um, it's been a really exciting week uh, from our perspective because there's so much going on on the wiki. Uh, many of you are uh, already engaging with your final project. Um, or playing around with various different Wikipedia articles, trying new things, uh, and getting ready for the final project. We've had lots of good questions on the class discussion page. Uh, and also, I think in particular, I think there's something that we did last week that has worked out really well and we really want to continue, uh, which is using the Etherpad page a little more actively to gather questions during the class session. So if you don't already have the Etherpad page open, uh, why don't you go ahead and do that? Um, let's, uh, if, if someone could type it into the chat window, uh, that would probably be helpful if people don't have the link handy. Um, or actually, it's right, it's right there on your screen. Um, so, yeah, so, so if you can add questions there during the class, the class session as they come up, or if you see other questions from someone else that you'd also like to know the answer to, just put a plus one next to it. Uh, and that'll make uh, that'll make it easier for us to look through and find the most compelling questions and make sure that we get to them in uh, in a reasonable order. And also, we'll be able to post those uh, on the class page. We posted last week's questions and a number of the answers on the week three class page, uh, and that'll make it possible for anyone who misses them to to get caught up. Um, I should note with that. Uh, we, that as you post them here, uh, keep in mind that they will be posted under a free license on the Wikipedia page. Uh, if for some reason there's something that you don't want to be published on Wikipedia, just make a note of that and we'll make sure to delete it before we, before we post that. Uh, so to, before we get started today, and we do, we have a, we have a, actually let me introduce our guest now so that you, uh, so that you know who's with us today. Uh, he's going to be doing a bit of a presentation later in the session. But we are very fortunate to have with us Andrew Lee, who is a longtime Wikipedian. He's been at it for several years longer than me, uh, going back pretty much to the very beginning. Um, and he's also the author of the, nine, the 2009 book, uh, which some of you have read as part of your homework, writing, or I'm sorry, The Wikipedia Revolution, which is uh, as definitive a history as I'm aware of, of the, the early days of Wikipedia, how it developed, uh, what the, the sort of historical framework and the, the philosophical reasons for starting Wikipedia um, and all of that. It's, a, it's an excellent read. If you haven't looked at it already, I highly recommend it. And uh, Andrew, later in the session, is going to be talking to us specifically about um, how Wikipedia articles about current unfolding news events develop and uh, and what's unique and worthwhile about Wikipedia in that context. Um, so, Andrew, I, 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 if there's anything you'd like to say an introduction now, uh, please feel free to jump in and otherwise we can just... Okay, can, can folks hear me okay? You want to say hello? Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to be yeah. here. I'm a big fan of the education project and more folks using Wikipedia in the classroom and to learn how to edit Wikipedia. So one of the things I'll talk about later is um, how healthy is the community and I'd love to hear some of your experiences and how easy or hard you folks found editing Wikipedia as newbies. Um, this is my third session about Wikipedia today. I gave a talk to a bunch of 60 plus year olds about Wikipedia this morning. We just had an edit-a-thon at the Smithsonian this afternoon. Um, so it's really interesting, the contrasts, and I'd love to talk about anything that's relevant to you folks today from those two experiences. Okay, thanks. Great to have you with us, Andrew. So um, 
before we dive into into the specific articles that people are working on and some examples, I want to uh, I want to review the kind of the structure of the course, the the final project and the badges. So um, let's I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up the uh, the Wikipedia page about our badges. We have two badges that you can earn as part of this course. The main one is the uh, the uh, the Wiki Sue Burba badge, and that's the that's the main one to. Um, sorry, I'm trying to type and talk at the same time. Give me just a moment. Uh, so, the the Burba badge is the main uh, badge for this course, and it reflects uh, completing the final project successfully and uh, and participating in the course. So I think. Everyone that I see uh, in the participant list here, I'm sure, is is doing great uh, on the on the participation front. Uh, we've seen most of you here every single time or close to it. And um, I'm sorry, I'm I'm realizing I didn't post that successfully. Small technical difficulties here. I'll be right back with you. Okay. So you should be seeing the final project page displayed now. I'm going to bump up the point size. Sorry about that. I thought I had this page prepared, and I, I had not. So uh, so the, the WikiSue Burba badge is now – the final project and the, the badges are now linked in the banner for our course. So I'm going to click on the badges page here, and this describes the two badges that you can earn. So the one on the left, the the – or the one on the right, the WikiSue Burba badge, is the, the principal one that you should be aiming towards. And essentially, if you take any article, the, any existing article, and increase it one level on the quality scale, scale that we've talked about, so if you bring it from uh, a stub article up, up to, actually with a stub or a start class article, either one of those should go to a C class, uh, or if you take a C class article and bring it up to B class, that's the main thing that we're looking for in the WikiSue Burba badge. Uh, we've had several people asking about how is that how is that measured. We already have uh, at least one student who has uh, uh, most likely already done that, um, and was wondering what's the uh, what's the specific process for getting it evaluated. And as we've covered in the in the course before, these lower quality ratings, as as distinct from good article and featured article, are not typically there's not a formal process that you go through to get them evaluated. So the main thing at the conclusion of the course is, for, is going to be for you to explain to us, the instructors, uh, why you believe that you brought it up uh, um, uh, one step on the quality scale and just make reference to what those criteria are uh, and explain to us why you got there. And it's, uh, it, it's, we, uh, in every case where someone has done this in the past, uh, the, the self-evaluation has been very good. Um, I, I don't think that we've ever declined someone the badge on the basis of it not legitimately going up. So um, if you if you genuinely believe that you did, then you probably did, and it's going to be fine at the end. But if you have questions along the way, if you want feedback about that, that's what the uh, the talk page is there for, and the sessions after the lecture in each class. So feel free to to ask uh, for feedback on how close you're coming to that point. Um, and the other thing I want to be sure to cover uh, in introduction today is once you've chosen your final your article for your final project, how to um, how to express that, how to how to record that. So I'm going to click back on our main course page. So click uh, February to April in the course banner on any one of our pages, and then if we scroll to the bottom, we have this section where when you registered for the course, your name got added to this list. So there's a line for every student in the course. And uh, as we scroll through, a, a few of you have already added your, uh, your course. So uh, researcher guy here has chosen uh, the article Open Course Library for his uh, final project. So if you were going to choose that same article, all you would do is type it into this field. Ty oh, I'm sorry, I just pasted the wrong thing. Um, open course library. So just type the exact title of the article and then click add article and then your line will show up like this. 
And uh, you, you can see next to his, because I'm an instructor, I have this line that says add myself as a reviewer. So this will enable us to follow your work and, uh, and, and see your progress on the article. So it's a good idea to get your article listed as early as possible because it's, it's going to make it easier for me to uh, see what you're doing and help you along. Okay, so with that, let's get to the, uh, to the main course material today. I'm going to just go back to our course page, our week four class page. And uh, if you haven't seen it, we did just, uh, there's a, a newly posted class outline here. So what I want to talk, to talk about next is how do Wikipedia articles grow in general? Um, you're, you're all at the point of taking on a project to work on. So uh, what we're hoping to do in this class and the week five class is give you some examples of, of Wikipedia articles growing and, uh, and various perspectives on how they should grow, what should be changed to improve an article. Um, and if you want to take the specific ideas that come up and use those as part of your work, that's great. If we're talking about an article that's of interest to you or if we happen to pick the one that is your final project, uh, feel free to just, just put these ideas into practice. Uh, or maybe you'll find that they're a good sort of general uh, introduction to, to how some people think about articles and, uh, and they may stimulate your, your work in that way. So we're going to, we're going to start with, we're, we're going to watch two videos as a part of this class. So I'm going to ask you to load up um, these two videos from YouTube. So the first one is a guest that we had in a previous session of the course, Stephen Laporte. And Stephen is a longtime Wikipedian and also he, uh, he's, very active on Wikipedia's sister site, Wikisource, which is, uh, is basically a place to present uh, existing publications that are in the public domain or available under a free license and uh, create nicely formatted uh, wiki versions of them. Um, so Stephen talked about an article that he worked on about a chef. And uh, this is about a, a four and a half minute video so why don't you all click on this link in the, uh, I'm going to paste it into our chat window in case that's easier for you uh, to click on. Oh, okay, it looks like Sarah just got that before me. So, uh, so load that up in your player and then we're going to just pause for about five minutes while everyone watches that. Okay, so I'll see you back here in at uh, 20 minutes past the hour.
Okay, so let's come back to the class. Uh, I know it, maybe leave a note in the chat window if you're ready. I'm going to just wait another moment or two in case people are finishing up. Actually, uh, as uh, CISO has started, people could hit the green check mark above the list of contacts to indicate they're done. Let's get a, for the red one, if <laughs> they're still watching. Okay, it looks like people are, are finished with that. So um, I would I'd like to keep moving uh, fairly quickly here so that we so that we are sure to leave plenty of time for Andrew. Um, so if you have questions that come out of this particular video, please put those on the Etherpad and we'll come back to those at the end of the session and uh, and hopefully we'll be able to ask some questions while we have Andrew with us as well so that you get to hear the perspective of, of another long-time Wikipedian and not just me all the time. Uh, so before we move on to the, the next video, we're going to watch a second video and then we're going to come back to Andrew. But let's, let's take a moment on the final project. Um, many of you have chosen a final project and, uh, and, and I've heard from many of you that you're still not really sure what you want to work on, that, um, that you know, maybe you have some ideas, uh, maybe you're not not sure whether you want to work on something you know a lot about already. Or something that you're just learning about or an existing article or start something new. So um, I'd like to just take a couple of minutes now and have everybody here. I, I, we, we will need to, um, oh yeah, Sarah's pointing out I should pull this up on the screen. That, the, the final project page. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, so I want to just take take a moment and, and give everyone a chance to put in a, a sentence or two about either what you chose for your final project and why, or if you're still trying to figure it out, um, just put a couple sentences about uh, what your thinking is on that, what you're considering and what you're, uh, and you know, what the, like, what might be holding you back from actually choosing a final project. And we're going to refer back to this later. It's going to uh, really give us a sense of where you're at and what we can do to help in choosing a final project or getting started on it. So let's take, uh, let's see, I'm going to just do a quick time check here. Let's take three minutes now and just put something on the Etherpad page. Uh, I'm going to just put a section in below uh, the list of participants called Final Project. And just put a line, so everyone can just start a, na a line for themselves uh, below that and put in a sentence or two. Or for people who prefer not to open multiple browsers, uh, you could just type it directly into the IM box and we can copy it over for a fuller list. Good point. Thanks, Sarah. So back in about three minutes. Okay, so take about another 30 seconds to wrap up any thoughts. Okay, and we will come back to this uh, later in the class session and then again in the lab. So uh, I see some of you are still typing, so rest assured we'll have 
plenty of time to explore this coming up. Uh, but for now, let's let's take a look at another video. So uh, up next, we have uh, Billy Mankey, Mankey, who is a um, uh, he joined us in the last session working on the Creative Commons uh, a, a grant for the U.S. Department of Labor. He does a good job of introducing it in the video. So I'm going to let you just jump right in. And on this one, you can jump to about 1 minute and 43 seconds uh, into the video. So that will turn it into about a 3 minute video because prior to that is just my introduction of him, which he actually uh, comes back and does a, a better introduction after that. So there's 143 in is uh, where you should start. And here's the, oh, I already got the link. So back in about three minutes. Okay, so I think if you can just click the green check mark when you're done watching the video at the top of the participants window. Okay, so it looks like people are wrapping that up. So again, um, if you can just keep a note of any questions or ideas that come up from that video, we will come back and discuss them a bit later. Um, we, uh, I think, I, I'm gonna uh, uh, let's let's go ahead now to uh, to Andrew's presentation. I wanted to have another uh, session where we look at each other's um, thoughts and questions about the final project, but let's let's save that until after to make sure that we have plenty of time uh, with Andrew. So, Andrew, are you ready to get going on your presentation? And if you have any, any links or anything that you want us to pull up, uh, feel free to put that in the chat. And I can drive it or I can turn over control of the screen, whichever you're more comfortable with. Okay. Uh, if you can hear me, um, probably easier for me to just drive. I've got two windows that I can kind of swap between if it's easy. Okay. Very good. And also, Andrew, just in case, we've had a, a few students coming and going. Uh, so maybe if you can just do a couple of words of brief intro recap uh, so that they know where you're coming from. Sure. Um, and if you can see my video, then I'll speak on camera for a little bit first before we get to the screen sharing. So um, as Pete mentioned, I have been editing Wikipedia since about 2003. And that was that was an interesting time because that was before Wikipedia was really mainstream or even known to most people. So um, I've been basically researching and writing about Wikipedia for 10 plus years at this point. Um, I'm teaching at American University in the Journalism and Communication School where I'm teaching a class now specifically about Wikipedia and GLAM, which if Pete hasn't told you, stands for Galleries, Libraries, Archives, Museums. And I can tell you a little bit later on why this is interesting or why Wikipedia is working with museums and cultural heritage institutions. Um, yeah, so that, that's basically my quick introduction. And I wrote a book called The Wikipedia Revolution, How a Bunch of Nobodies Created the World's Greatest Encyclopedia. And I, to this date, I don't think anyone in Wikipedia has complained about being called a nobody. In fact, I think most people kind of are proud of the fact that they're small and nobodies and made the fifth most visited website for the entire world.
All right. So are we set, um, Pete, to move on to screen sharing? Yes, absolutely. Uh, do you need me to okay. uh, to put you into that mode, or do you see how to do it? Uh, okay, let me turn off my video, yep. and I see a screen sharing, application sharing button, but it's not enabled for me. Ah, uh, okay. So I think we need to make you a moderator again. I think, did you get kicked off and come back on? Yeah, I think I'm not a moderator yeah. at this point. Okay, so I'm doing that just now. Okay. Sorry, everybody, we didn't go through this as uh, thoroughly as we should have ahead of time. Okay, I think I see the application sharing. Good. All right, so let me... Uh, one note before you get into it, Andrew, is the, um, the, the middle button that says application sharing will, will, will be able to see your cursor and see you scrolling around, so I think that's the mode you're in. Never mind, I think this is going to be familiar. Go ahead. Does that work? Do you see my black slide, Wikipedia, how a bunch of nobodies? Yes. Great. Okay. Hopefully this will stand up. To... And do do pause on each each video because we have some students with very slow connections, so it may take a moment for that screen to load. Sure. And I'm going to stick to audio and uh, still slides, hopefully. All right. So as I mentioned before, there's my book, The Wikipedia Revolution. Um, if you're into Japanese, Bahasa, Indonesian, Russian, you can read it in those um, languages. Uh, one of the things that might be interesting to folks here is that the Computer History Museum, which uh, Pete has actually helped with, um, is going to have an, art, uh, an exhibit about Wikipedia. So this is kind of a weird reverse museum exercise, which is um, how do you create a physical exhibit about a virtual product? So that is um, interesting to see how they do it. But uh, Pete has helped out. I've been advising the Computer History Museum on that, and hopefully some folks here will have a chance to see that. Um, some other things I've been working on include um, another book about Wikipedia and it's kind of follow on effects, which I'll talk about a little bit today. So, um, Pete, how much have they heard about the history of Wikipedia, Newpedia, where things have come from to create? Um, so we, we covered this uh, in the first session um, and it, it, it may be there was a lot of information coming at people. in that first session, so a bit of review would probably be interesting. Uh, but I think, I think at this point that probably what people are hungriest for is, uh, is actually looking at a specific example of a, a Wikipedia article and how it, how it has evolved. Right. So probably so more I thought what I could do is talk a little bit about how Wikipedia, um, how Wikipedia's articles um, evolved. And let me just show you, first of all, with this example here, which is, which I think is quite enlightening. So Pete might have told you a little bit about the history of Wikipedia and that in the early days in 2003, um, 2000, well, 2001 to 2003, there was, um, you know, just a, a sprint towards creating more content. There was certainly guidelines about making sure you use reliable sources and that things were verifiable, but certainly not to the extent that it is today. So I love, I love showing the Barack Obama article for this example alone, which is showing how much of the Wikipedia article on Barack Obama is actually references. So this is a snapshot of the Barack Obama article um, as taken yesterday. And there's a tool on the Mac called Paparazzi, which that's, allows you to capture an entire article like it's printed on toilet paper like this. So it's like a long strip. And you can see the entire article here. And 50%, you can see, of the article is the text. You can see Barack Obama is the 44th current president. But if you look down here, this is a fairly recent uh, phenomenon where 50% of the entire article is references, um, which I think is quite astonishing. So if you look down, there's about 340 different references um, in the article. And you can see even for uh, something as simple as, you know, where he was born, you need like five or 10 references because if you don't put in 10 references there, you're going to have your your birthers, your uh, folks who come in and try to debate with, you know, Barack Obama's birthplace. So it is quite interesting to see how the referencing standard and the verifiability standard in Wikipedia is so high now that it is not unusual to see articles where one third of its entire length are uh, references. Um, that is simply because the culture of citations and verifiability, reliable sources, um, is so high now. So I thought that was quite interesting to, to see that phenomenon there. And feel free if anyone has any questions to just chime in in the chat room and I'll 
pop in there once in a while to see if there's any questions about these two. And, and I Andrew, I think, to show you, I think one, ahead, sorry. one thing it might be worth uh, pointing out just on this specific example, since we have so many students that are not uh, Americans, it actually uh, it actually has been a very controversial issue where Barack Obama was born in the U.S. I don't know if that's something that's known <laughs> in other countries, but because the the uh, the president of the United States has to have been born in the U.S., uh, there have been people who've really demanded a very high level of proof uh, and questioning its legitimacy. Anyway, continue. Right, uh, that's a great point. I mean, so one of the funny weird anecdotes is that when I was doing my book promotion in 2009, I, I just started wading into the whole birther um, issue. Um, so my book was launched in 2009 early. So, you know, Barack Obama was just elected in 2008. And I think, you know, during the election, it was an issue. But, um, but after he was elected, then all these people who were really not happy with him being elected started picking on anything they could. And they really honed in on the fact that, my God, this, this guy was born in Kenya. Well, we all know he was born in Hawaii and all the proof was there. So um, so these people just really started coming on full, full steam. And when I was doing my book promotion on radio, we would get all these call-ins because I was, most people were saying and called in about, oh, how do we rely on Wikipedia? Is it, well, you started getting all these really weird uh, Barack Obama conspiracy theorists. And I was very controversial in saying on the radio, Oh, but we all know this is pretty settled. If you look at the documents, it's pretty clear Obama was born in Hawaii. Oh, my God, I opened myself up to tons of <laughs> criticism for that one uh, <laughs> that one phrase. So, yes, in the U.S., it's still a weird, weird contingent that still believes that um, uh, someone went back in time and actually manipulated the newspaper in Honolulu to uh, show a – announcement in the newspaper from the 1950s that Barack Obama was born that day. It's, it's crazy, but this is the things you have to put up with in something as popular as English Wikipedia. So, um, so yeah, I, I really do like this way of illustrating articles. It's not that common to be able to fit an entire article in this strip like that. So I often like capturing lots of Wikipedia articles vertically like this. Um, it really does show you kind of the 10,000 foot view of how, um, how these things work. I don't know whether we have an article about the birther movement to answer someone's question in the chat room. I, I'm, I, if someone wants to look that up, I'd be interested to find out. I don't know if we want to give them the pleasure of knowing that there's an article about them, but um, yeah, I'm kind of sick of them personally, but hey, you know, they do exist and maybe they do deserve an article. So let's take a look at uh, one of the articles I've been following for the last week or so. I was going to hone in on three articles. One is this one about Crimea, which is quite interesting. Another one is about the Malaysian plane. And then the third one is about an article I created on Breaking News um, about the Brooklyn, I'm sorry, the East Harlem apartment fire or apartment explosion that happened in New York City. But let's just start with this one about the Crimea. Um, this is not that different than if you look at this page today. I snapshotted this last night. Just to give you the 10, 10 penny or one penny tour of this page, you all know that this is the discussion page. Highly, highly recommended that you get familiar with this and look at the talk pages for active pages. It is quite an eye-opening experience to see what goes into um, what goes into the writing and modification of pages. Sometimes it can be dizzying. Sometimes it is frustrating. But I always point people who are skeptical about Wikipedia's accuracy or the process that that goes into writing Wikipedia to always look at the talk page because you will find usually very very uh, thoughtful individuals here who care about quality. And that's my, my big recommendation to folks. Look at the talk page, especially. For big pages like this. The other thing you should know, of course, the edit button, I'm sure you've looked at that already. The view history, we'll go deeper into this, but not just the history of the edits, but there's some cool tools at the top of that history page that you should all know about. Um, Disambiguation. So this page in particular is quite interesting because you look up Crimea, but you actually get pointers to two other pages. 2014 Crimean crisis, and then the 2014 Russian military intervention in Ukraine. So this is a little bit uh, unique in Wikipedia in that when you look at the Crimea article, which is about kind of historic Crimea, maybe about the, the general area, you actually get other pointers to more current articles about things that are happening right there. And then you also have other things here about um, the Crimean Peninsula, which is probably about the geology or geography. And then you also have the Republic of Crimea. So there's a lot of jumping off points for this one article here. And people have added these links at the top of the article, not typical of most articles in Wikipedia. 
If you look here, this is the protection. You might have seen these uh, icons in some uh, pages on Wikipedia. Normally, when you see this lock icon, it is what they call semi-protection, meaning that the, um, the article can be edited by experienced users, but not newbies and not anonymous IP editors. So um, that's pretty, pretty cool to see, you know, the semi-protection in some articles. Can I just, um, as can I just make a, a brief point on that? I think for, for just about everyone in here, uh, that definition of experienced contributor would already apply to you. It's, I, I believe the threshold is that your account has to be at least 10 days old and you have to have made at least 10 edits to, and that includes talk pages and course pages and everything. So um, it's, a, it's a fairly uh, reachable threshold that I think most of you have already passed. Right, right. If you're in week four of your class, I'm sure you've reached that threshold. One of the frustrating things here is that they can't even tell you whether it's a three-day period or seven-day period or ten-day period. It's a floating, floating parameter. Who, who even knows? But basically, it's meant to prevent people who register for an account and then just try to um, vandalize the page. Um, the other thing that you should be aware of is a, what they call a hat note, which is right there. Um, some articles have multiple hat notes warning you about things, whether the quality is bad, it needs more references, there's issues that need to be solved. I'm sure you've seen those as well. And then finally, the info box on the right-hand side which is quickly being, uh, I don't want to say being replaced, but being upgraded to include what we call Wikidata. So a lot of the stuff in here are dates, um, there are times, there are stats, and they're just typed into Wikipedia. But increasingly, this is being moved into another thing called Wikidata, which allows you to share data across Wikipedia editions more easily. But what's really cool is that if you go into the View History button there, there are some ways to look at what views a page is getting. So have you looked at the visitors page before, Pete? Yes, I've, I've pulled it up in relation to a couple of articles, but not a whole lot. So it's, I think it's always welcome. Cool. So this is the one on Crimea, which is, is quite interesting, right? So this is the Wikipedia article traffic statistics, which you can change to 30, 60, or 90 days. But you can see that during the crisis where, you know, Russian troops actually moved in, or actually we don't even know if they're Russian, but they're, they're unmarked troops. You saw a lot of interest in that. And then it started to go down and then start to come back up again with this Crimean referendum, right? So this is a really cool feature of Wikipedia to show how many people are watching your articles or viewing your articles. Um, another thing that you can click on is the editing activity, which I find is a nice way to digest what has been happening over the years with an article. This doesn't show you a lot if you're, if you're looking at an article just created a, a few weeks ago or something like that. But you can see here in Crimea, there's a lot of activity in 2007, not a lot in the early days, right? In fact, the first four edits were all, um, you know, in that first year, and then you start to see in 2007. This is generally what we see as the heyday of Wikipedia. 2007 saw peak activity in almost every single category, but then you start to see a slump in activity as well. Um, it, it just might be, and we're still trying to figure this out as researchers in Wikipedia, whether this is just a historic anomaly that, hey, 2007 is just a confluence of the growth of Wikipedia plus the rise of social media. And in fact, we don't need as many editors today as we did in 2007, but you can see that in 2014, even in the first three months now, we see a huge increase in activity there so that it's the most active year so far because of all the crazy things happening there. Right? So this is probably not a surprise to you that if you look at um, online communities, it's generally what we call a 99-1 community on Wikipedia. 90% of the people who are on Wikipedia are lurkers, meaning they just read, um, they, they are uh, not participating in anything. And then you have 9% of the people who visit Wikipedia contribute a little bit here and there. But then really the 1% of Wikipedians are the dedicated core editors of Wikipedia. And if you look at some of the rough numbers, you know, about 5% of the community make about 50% of the edits. It's roughly in that area, which is, uh, that's, that's pretty significant, uh, the nonlinear distribution of folks who edit Wikipedia, which I thought was quite, quite interesting. So, you know, Crimea is a good example of an article that shows some of these things, uh, these dynamics of, you know, breaking news or current events really affecting not only the um, visitors, but also the activity in articles there. Um, 
then I thought I could also show you an example of the evolution of a brand new article because Crimea has existed for a while, so that article has existed for a while. But let me show you another um, another example of what we can do with um, a new article. Okay, so I'm trying to get back to Blackboard Classmates. Okay, application sharing. I'm going to stop sharing and start another share. That'll get me back to, hopefully, a web browser. Okay, so do people see 2014 yes. East Harlem buildings explosion on the screen? Okay, great. So hopefully you see this. I thought this was an interesting example of an article that I actually created. I was kind of surprised an hour, roughly an hour after this explosion, that very few people, um, I mean, that, that no one was really talking about it. So I had to add this to the current events page, and then I had to create the article. So I'm um, kind of a news junkie, obviously, since I'm teaching journalism. But I always check out on the main page of Wikipedia the current events button. So if you're on the main page of Wikipedia, um, this part here, which is called in the news, is to me a bureaucratic mess. You need to nominate an article. You need to debate people who think this box has too much US-centric news. And after two days, maybe something will be done. I think that's completely inane. So I wind up going to more current events, which is a wiki, whereas topics in the news is actually a bureaucratic mess. Uh, and you need to nominate and debate and, and really get into the weeds of you know, voting and all that stuff. Just, so just I a quick note, much Andrew. More um, as yes. as you're as you're scrolling through the page, that's really where the lag comes in. So um, if you can if you can kind of jump and pause rather than sc scrolling fluidly, it it comes through a lot better. Okay, I'll try to pause on each page for at least five ten seconds. Thanks. Um, so it is hard to be the first to a news event. So sometimes it is kind of cool to be the the ones that start it. On the other hand, sometimes I. I don't want to be the first one. I'm hoping that there is an active community that uh, is actually as into the news as I am that, that creates these articles. So you can see that, for example, for Tuesday, which is today, you see the articles here that are related to um, events that happened today, including the crash of a helicopter in Seattle, more on the Crimean crisis, and um, Syrian developments there. So one of the things I did was I hit the edit button here and I created the article on East Harlem apartment explosion, which is what you get oops, right there. Okay, so this is the 2014 East Harlem buildings explosion. Um, one of the things I did right away was I wrote this one paragraph or probably a, a subsection of this and saved it right away. And I'll show you the edit history of this in a second. The other thing I did was I went to comb social media. I went to look at Twitter and I looked at all these other places to see what pictures were being put up there. And I saw some really amazing pictures. These are actual pictures taken by a guy with a drone aircraft in New York City, which is amazing. And he was posting these pictures um, up on, I'm sorry, this, I don't know if this is the drone. I don't know. I have to think about whether these are the drones. I know he was doing drone video and I asked him about this. But there's a guy who was taking high quality pictures here with his uh, camera and he's posting them on Twitter and said, oh, by the way, anyone who wants to use these can use them for anything they want. So I sent him a message on Twitter saying, could you release these under the CC BY SA license? And I looked on Flickr and he had already released them under CC BY. So that was great. I went to Flickr, pulled down these pictures, um, looked at them, said these are great, and I went to Wikimedia Commons and uploaded these two pictures right away. And if you click on these, you will see the attribution to him. Um, this is this guy, Orange Adnan. So a photographer is this guy named Adnan Islam, released under that license. So I got a picture in there within I think five or 10 minutes of my starting that article. And for breaking news articles, I love doing that because more and more people are aware of the CC BY licenses and are releasing their stuff outright. Like that. So um, that's pretty cool to see all that, uh, all that multimedia being put out there. Um, 
Andrew, I, just just in case uh, in case you're not following the chat, um, we are our our one hour is getting very close to the end, and I really want to be sure uh, that we have time for a few questions for you. Sure. Uh, I think if if you're able to stay for a few minutes after, that's fine. Uh, but we probably don't want to go more than about five or ten minutes past the hour before okay. we take a break. I, I can take questions. That's fine. Great. Uh, So uh, I'm going to – let's – Andrew, I don't know if you got the Etherpad uh, loaded up, but um, people have been posting questions in there. Oh. I think questions that are really specific to our class, like how to, you know, how to get started on the final project and everything, I think we can defer and we'll get to those after the break. Uh, but anyone that has a question specifically for uh, the content that Andrew has covered or uh, in either of our videos, now is a great time to bring those up. Um, you know, if you want to talk about these uh, – how these kinds of articles can grow. Uh, and so I'm going to post the Etherpad link again in the chat window for anyone that has missed it. And uh, Andrew, you're still screen sharing now, so I, I, I think maybe you're getting to one of these questions already. Someone's asking uh, about how you got to some of those statistics, so maybe you can show that. Right. So this one is the edit history of Crimea, and there's some interesting things here. So one, the statistics are up here under external tools. Well, personally, I wish this was more burned into Wikipedia or Wikimedia um, you know, software, because these are all just kind of a la carte tools. And you put your mouse on top of it, you'll see at the bottom of the screen it says this is using tools.wmflabs.org. And these are just some really clever smart Wikipedia techie folks who create the tools to do this. But I encourage you to take a look at each of these things. You can look at, you know, who are the top contributors to an article. You can see the revision history. The reason why I want to show this one for Crimea is that this is happening as we speak, or it's probably about 30 minutes ago. You can see here some significant edits by this guy named Hawaii 5 who has tried to delete a huge portion of the page on Crimea saying Crimea is no longer part of Ukraine. Um, and you can see this person having a red link here is a pretty new user, and he's actually changed it one, two, three times, meaning that he's probably going to be blocked sometime soon because you're not supposed to revert a page three times like that. Um, so this is a pattern of a, you know, I don't want to ca call him an edit warrior, but this is a clear sign of an edit dispute happening in real time in front of your eyeballs when you see this person. Um, you know, revert a page three times to try to make a point. Um, we have a so, we have a specific uh, question for you. Uh, whenever we, when you're done with that, go ahead. Good time. Okay. Uh, so one of our students is asking, how much does your clout or reputation as a seasoned Wikipedian allow you to do what you do, vis-a-vis uh, -vis current events, uploading other people's photos, etc., uh, versus what a newbie can do? So um, it, is is there are, are, are there ways in which newbies are sort of subject to extra scrutiny and would have trouble doing some of the kinds of bold edits that you're talking about? Right. Uh, I think that's a great question. And unfortunately, you you probably have hit upon the correct conclusion, which is that your seniority and rank in the community does make quite a bit of difference. It used to not be so much the case, and maybe Pete has a different opinion than I do, but I find that um, once they see that you're a seasoned editor and if you're an administrator, which I am, they will leave you a lot more rope uh, to do things with. Um, you know, one of the one of the down. Downsides, I think, of Wikipedia these days is that you cannot even create an article easily like you used to be able to. You now have to go for an article creation. You need to submit it to a process to even get an article created. I've told my students in my classroom, bypass all That's of that. That's what we advise as well. Yes. Articles. Just create the article out of thin air. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's the problem is that I have students go in there, try to create an article through articles creation. It gets rejected, and I just pull it out of the pile and create it right away. I'm sure other editors see me do that and go, uh, okay, that guy knows what he's doing. I'm not going to fight him on this one. So that's the unfortunate side of things. Um, I wish it was a little nicer environment for newbies, but... That's that's the way it is at this point. Uh, so we have someone asking about glam in the uh, in the chat window. This is uh, 
she's, she's a librarian, and I think we have uh, at least two or three librarians in the class. So uh, if you want to talk a little bit about that, that would be great. It's actually not something that I've talked about in the class. Oh, okay, great. Well, let me just show you very quickly my, my three slides that make sense of this, and I hope this will be useful to library folks. I think it does. Um, on why I'm teaching this class on uh, Wikipedia and GLAM. So can you see this knowledge production priority slide that I just put up there? Uh, it's loading, yes. It's, it's still scrolling okay. through. So I'll just read this gray background says knowledge production priorities. And what the reason why this class is being taught is for this reason. Um, I kind of categorize the way we care about information as having three different priorities, right? We either care about how fast we get information, how accurate the information is, or how deep the information is, right? So if you think about what journalists do, what I typically do as a journalist, is we care mainly about what's fast and accurate, right? Journalism is all about how fast you can get something out there and how, how accurate you can. Depth, uh, it can, it's, it's wishy-washy, you know, but speed and accuracy is number one. Now, if you compare that to what librarians and historians and museum people do, it's actually a very different thing, right? They don't care about speed. They care about depth and accuracy. Well, maybe librarians care about speed, but you know, museum people, as Pete and I know, they take two years to plan out a museum exhibit that will, will live for five years in a physical form. That is not fast, but they care about how accurate an exhibit is and they care about how deep the exhibit is, right? So these are your history book writers and your folks who care about um, you know, deep and accurate storytelling. So my argument is that before Wikipedia came around, we had a big problem in that we had this real knowledge gap, right? This, this red, that red area right in there between you know, what dribbled off the pages of the newspaper as news and then what became history. So this is a big problem in that we needed to read five or 10 days worth of newspapers to understand a deep issue or we had to wait for it to be written up in an encyclopedia or a book. And before the internet, we had to wait months or maybe a year for that to show up. So we've always had this knowledge gap. And my argument is that Wikipedia now uniquely fills that knowledge gap. Right? We had Wikipedia start out in 2001, 2003 as being very fast, but not really that accurate, not really that deep. But over time, it has actually become much, much better in what it does to the point where now Wikipedia is in fact the working draft of history, right? The nickname of news is it's the first draft of history. Um, and Wikipedia now bridges these two worlds so that it is in fact the working draft of history that anyone can edit and anyone can write. And that's why I think it's really interesting for Wikipedia to be collaborating with museums and folks in that sector and also be, to be collaborating with journalists as well because Wikipedia is now, you know, the, the confluence of these two worlds in a real interesting way. And that's why, um, you know, museums and archives down here in DC are so interested in working in this space because it is this, this balance of speed, depth, and accuracy in a way that we've never had before. So that's my basic uh, idea for the class. And so far, it's been, been a fun experiment in working with those folks that, that have never really worked with Wikipedia before. Does that Great. answer some of the questions about why? Yeah, uh, well, we have. We have um, we have a specific question of whether your slides are available for anyone to look yeah. at. Yeah, I'll upload them to SlideShare and give you a, a link to that. I'm happy to Wonderful, that. and we'll put that link in our uh, on our class page, and uh, and we'll make a mention of it in our in our email after the class too. Right. Um, I, I also I wanted to just getting back to the question that I, I think you were right is really one of the the key questions about Wikipedia about reputation on the site and um, you know how you can how you can uh, make it more likely that your edits will stick and that people won't uh, object to them or revert them. Uh, I I just I, one of the things that we we try to do throughout this class is suggest specific things that people can do to um, to make their own path a little easier. And uh, one of the things that I really try to uh, to emphasize is whenever there's there's some kind of dis disagreement. The more you can uh, base your argument for, like, for including a fact in an article or for deleting a fact from an article, um, the more you can base that on Wikipedia's policies, the more uh, useful and credible your argument is. So, um, 
you know, if just as an example, if you say, I think we should Im improve this because I think it's important, um, someone's probably going to look at that and say, well, that pe person doesn't really know how Wikipedia works. You know, shouldn't they know it's not just their opinion? Uh, it should be based on a source. But if you say, I think this should be included because it's mentioned in these two or three reliable sources that, you know, that comply with Wikipedia's reliable sources guideline, um, that's the kind of thing that's going to help someone else recognize that you know something about Wikipedia policy and that you're that you're working in the same direction that they are. Um, so, yeah. Andrew, I, any, I any other good. thoughts and kind of along those lines? Yeah, I, I, I think I, I agree with you there. And can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think that's great advice. I, I Nothing more annoying than someone reverting or making an edit with either no edit summary or very terse edit summary on something that's big. I always err on the side of leaving a talk page comment on either the user's page or on the page of the uh, article itself. There is a really nice convention now in Wikipedia where you can use the ping template. I don't know if you have seen this before, but if you put um, brace, brace, ping, P-I-N-G, the pipe character, and then the username afterwards, and then close the um, thing, which is basically a template, it, it, it notifies the person that you've named in there, in their um, notifications that, oh, by the way, someone mentioned you in this comment, someone mentioned you on this talk page. And it's a way, I think it's a real nice courtesy to say, you know, if I'm commenting on the Crimea page saying, I'm about to delete this paragraph because I think it's irrelevant now after Putin's you know, referendum, but um, I'd love to hear your opinions. And then you put ping, Pete Forsyth, ping, Sarah, um, you know, so just a courtesy to say, I'm making a big change. I'd love to hear your feedback on it. I'm, I'm not trying to do this under the, under the cover of darkness. I want people's opinions. And then one thing I've been doing recently um, for the last few months is to just rant, not only randomly thank people, but going out of my way to hit the thank button five times a day, you know, just to say, oh, that was a good edit. And in the past, Wikipedia was just, you'd look at the edit and say, oh, that was a good edit, and you just wouldn't give any feedback to people. Now there's a thank button. I'm not sure how much it helps, but I think it, if there's any hope of giving some goodwill in the community, I'm willing to try it. And I, I do like the idea of maybe one thank, you know, make someone make someone's uh, editing experience that much more pleasurable in Wikipedia, because God knows there's plenty of reasons to get really antsy and really annoyed in Wikipedia. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm encouraging folks to use any method to try to make the mood better. So that's what I would have been trying to do is randomly um, find five reasons to thank people each day. That's, uh, that's great advice. And I, I think um, some of our students will have seen the result of that. Uh, I tried to, when I see you making worthwhile edits uh, between classes, I try to hit the thank button. Um, so you've probably, some of you at least have seen that, um, that red notification icon at the top of your screen. And, uh, and that shows you that, that I've seen your edit. So, as Andrew points out, that's something that you can and really should do as you're going along, as you're looking through uh, the history screens of who's made what edits. Um, you can give someone a smile if you, uh, if you express appreciation for their edit in that way. Right. I mean, one of, one of the weird things about Wikipedia is that very early on, there was a contingent who basically said, you know, Wikipedia is not a social network. This is not a place to play, to have fun, to socialize. It's a place for serious encyclopedia work. And a lot of the spirit of the community was kind of ripped out at one point saying, you know, don't play your little games of chess and checkers on here. Don't create your little clubs. And I think that really did hurt Wikipedia long term. So we're finding little ways for that social interaction to be brought back in. But, uh, but it's tough. Um, in general, Wikipedia is kind of a, uh, you know, still a, all about encyclopedia writing, but the Wikimedia Foundation is trying new ways to inject more social media functions into the software. Okay. Well, uh, with that, we're we're at about 10 minutes past the hour, so I think everyone's probably ready for a break. So I'd like to wrap this up. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us and bringing all of this fascinating research and information to us. And thanks everyone for your great uh, questions. Um, we will break until, let's take our standard 20 minute break, which will put us at uh, half past the hour.
So if you have questions that you want to queue up for when we come back for the lab session, just put them in the Etherpad or add a plus one next to other people's. Um, I think we, I think we have. Um, Oh, sorry, I was distracted for a moment. Yeah, I, I think we have a, uh, a, a nether zone. We were going to be looking at your article last week and didn't get to it, so I think we'll probably want to start off with that. Uh, but I, I can see we've already got lots of questions building up in the Etherpad, so looking forward to the rest of the hour. So thanks again, Andrew. Uh, oh, and right. and uh, if uh, Andrew, I'm I'm I would imagine you're probably willing to take questions on your talk page. Is that? I hope I'm not putting you on the spot there, but if if people are intrigued by the stuff that you presented, maybe they can give you a message there too. Yeah, talk page is fine. You feel free to tweet at me if you want. It's uh, my handle's the same everywhere. It's Slashedo on Twitter. It is Slashedo on Wikipedia. So either the talk page or in Twitter. Great. Well, thanks so much. All right. We'll good luck, everyone. All. Okay, and we'll see the rest of you at half past. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Andrew. I'm joining in with my usual last word. A lot of people have been expressing the question, I feel a little bit behind, how can I catch up? And um, we will definitely get to that after the break. So talk to you all then. Okay, welcome, every, welcome back, everyone. Um, just making sure that my, let's see, is my mic, are you hearing me? You sound good. Okay, good. Um, so I've been looking through the, uh, the final project section on the, with the Etherpad, and it looks like people have been posting lots of thoughts about what they're working on or what they're thinking about working on. So uh, I definitely want to make this a major, um, you know, I, I want to put a lot of attention on this in the remainder of the class because it sounds like uh, there are a number of people who could use some help in narrowing down their ideas and figuring out what they're going to do for their final project. Um, before we dive into that, uh, another zone, if you're, if, you, if you're back with us, um, I, I know we had talked about looking at your uh, draft article last week and then didn't get to it before you had to leave us. So I'd, I'd like to start with that. Um, if you could drop us a link at the article that you wanted to look at, that would be great. And I know you've also had some, um, some problems with image uploads, so I think we could, we could talk about that as well. So uh, maybe you're. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just continue with with some of these other issues if you're um, if you're not quite ready to jump in. I see you're asking to hold on. So I'll just take a, a quick one from the Etherpad page, and we'll come back to you in just a moment. Um, so the, the the first the first question that I saw under final project, um, which I, I think was intended as a joke, but I think there's a serious point to be made here. Um, uh, Gating asked, does it have to be just one? Um, and I, I think this is, I, I think you'll probably, different people will encounter this at different points where, uh, you know, maybe it takes a while to feel confident in, in clicking the edit button and in starting to work on articles, but once you do, you might find that you've, 
made changes to, you know, maybe five articles and the next day it might be 10 or 15 or something. And before you know it, your watch list is, is, is like a waterfall. Every time you log in, there are like 20 or 30 new edits that other people have made to the pages. And it's, it's really easy to get to a point where what you're doing on Wikipedia is very overwhelming. And so that's one of the reasons why this course is designed around the idea of really focusing your energy on one article. Um, it's, it's definitely very encouraged that you should continue to dabble on other articles, but I think just keeping in mind the one article that you're most committed to improving over a several week period is a, is a good key to, um, to staying focused and not getting overwhelmed. Of course, everybody uh, approaches their work differently, and if you, you know, if you feel like taking on more articles, that's your choice. Um, it's just a recommendation, uh, just something to keep in mind. Okay, so I see you've posted a draft in the chat window. I'm going to open this in the screen sharing. Uh, if it's easier for other people to just click it in your own browser to follow along, you're welcome to do that too. Um, let me just turn on the, the sharing. Okay, so, um, and uh, another zone, if you have a microphone, you're of course welcome to uh, join us and talk talk us through this. Um, I'm going to just sort of start uh, looking through it and thinking out loud as uh, as I look at it to kind of give a sense of what I'm what I'm seeing. Uh, the the first thing that jumps out at me is that you have a pretty thorough uh, a pretty thorough lead section. You have several sentences there, and then it looks like you've really built an extensive article with a number of different sections. So uh, my first impression is that you've put a lot of work into this. I'm going to just jump down to the references section. I see 14 different ref references. That's great. That's, um, you know, a, a very strong sign that you've, you've, you've really put a lot of research and a lot of work into this. Um, so as we look through the, session, the sections, I'm seeing those, those footnotes are distributed pretty well throughout the sections. It doesn't look to me like there are any sections that don't have um, well, okay, so the curatorial work section doesn't seem to have any footnotes. Um, so that might be something to think about um, if you can, uh, if you can find any, you know, news articles that, that talk specifically about her work in curation. Uh, it, it's always good to have at least one footnote in a section. Um, I see you have a, a list of books that she's worked on, so that's great. Um, you might want to make this a bullet list. That's sort of a more uh, a more standard way to do it. It's 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 kind of it's author's choice. There's not really a um, a hard and fast rule about this. Uh, I'm I'm curious. I don't know what these download notes are. I'm guessing that you might have um, copied and pasted the list of books from another web page, and it just pulled in this as a, a download link that was on the page. So there might be a little bit of kind of cleanup and standardization you might do in there. Let me, um, I'm going to, oh, you know what I want to do is I want to log out and log back in in my demo account uh, just so that, um, so that you guys are seeing the software in a more familiar, uh, I have some user preferences that are not standard. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, okay, so I'm seeing in the chat window, uh, Sarah is saying, I don't think people should at all feel like their first attempt needs to look anything like this. So yes, that's very good point. This is, uh, you know, my, my first impression of this another zone is this, this is well above and beyond what we're expecting in this course, um, which I, I don't want to discourage you from that at all. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, but if other people are looking at this and thinking, wow, I can't even imagine writing something like that uh, in the limited time I have for this course, that's fine. Uh, it, it, it doesn't have to be anything approaching this. And I'm sure as we go along and look at uh, some of the other things people have chosen to take on, uh, you're going to see things that are that are more manageable. Um, one thing I want to show in the um, the books section, I'm going to click the edit section button here, and <clears throat> so I can see each each line is is uh, is basically plain text. I see you do have italics. These uh, double these two single quotes uh, at each end of the line. We'll turn that into italics. Uh, but for the most part, this is unformatted. And I want to show you a little trick um, if you wanted to put this in 
a, um, in a template that, that consistently formats all of them. So I'm going to just give a separate line here, and I'm going to click this Cite button in the toolbar. You see that drops down a second line on the toolbar. And then you see this templates here. I'm, before I do this, I'm going to copy everything out of this first line. And uh, out of the templates menu, I'm going to choose Cite Book. And that pulls up this nice form uh, that I can fill in. And actually, if you know the ISBN number of a book, um, you can just type it right in here and click search, and it will actually find that and pre-populate this form. Uh, it'll search an online database and find the name of the author and the book and everything like that. But if you don't have that, you can just paste it all in. I just paste, copied everything in, in a chunk, so I'll just paste it all in this first field and, and then copy and paste little pieces of it out. So University of California Press, I'm going to select that and cut it. And then I'll go into the publisher section and paste it in there, delete that stray period at the end. Uh, same thing with the, the year. I'll cut that out and put it in the date field. Um, and all of these, all the formatting you don't need because this template is going to take care of that. So pursuit of a sustainable, so this is the title of the book. And I think maybe I didn't copy the name of the author, but I'll just do a preview so you can see how this is going to, so it's going to, it's going to show up like this at the bottom. Uh, and it, oh, I see it is, uh, I just put that in the wrong field, didn't I? So I ca caught my mistake. So if I put that back in and uh, preview again, and then show parse preview. So what this is doing, the first one is the preview of the text it's going to put in the wiki article. And then the second, the parsed preview is what it's going to show up as to the reader once it's all interpreted. Um, okay, so this, I'm going to click insert, and that's going to put it into the, into the article. So, um, let's see, what, something got, oh, I see, it put it at the end of the line. So this is the part that I just put in, the part that's highlighted right now. Um, one thing, it, it, that template, that, that tool that I just used is going to assume that we're using it as a footnote. And actually, in this section, we're not trying to use it as a footnote, so we're going to delete out the ref tags at the beginning and the end, because otherwise, all we would see here is a little bracketed number one or something like that, and it would be expecting to push it down into the footnote section. So, uh, and now I'm going to just do a preview at the bottom. And we can see this, this top line is the one that, uh, that another zone had put in manually, and the second line is the version that came up when I used that template, that site tool. Okay, so um, so another zone. Do you have any specific questions? I want to. Um, there are any number of directions I could go with little tricks like this, but if there are specific things that are on your mind that you're wondering about, please let us know. Um, and I guess actually, the, just as an overall uh, bit of feedback, I would say this article is very much ready to be published on Wikipedia. Uh, there's no need at all to keep it in your own sandbox at this point. Um, once you are at a point where you have, I would say, even uh, four or five references, uh, especially if a couple of them are really, you know, centrally focused on that topic, it's, re it's ready to be published. And uh, it's great to keep working on something after you put it on Wikipedia. So I would really encourage you just to, to push this online um, onto the, the main Wikipedia space. The way that you do that, uh, I'm going to go through this. I'm not going to do it for you. I'll, let, I'll leave it to you to do when you're when you feel comfortable with it. But um, is just to click move in the title bar. Um, in my and it's collapsed into this drop down menu. Uh, I think that's maybe just because of my screen size. It might just show up in your menu bar. And you would click move, and it'll ask you what title you want it to be in. So instead of user space, you're going to click here and just choose article in parentheses at the top. And then take out the, the uh, these parts, which are specific to it being in your sandbox. And for reason, you would say something like, uh, ready to publish. It doesn't really matter too much what you put in there. If you feel like it's ready, it's, uh, it's it should be fine. Uh, and then you would just click move page, you could choose to watch the page, you probably want to. 
Um, so, okay, so Sarah is pointing out this is how you how you rename an article. Yes. So if you um, if if this article were on Wikipedia and it was under the wrong title, like if it um, if it was capitalized improperly or had a misspelling in the title or something like that, it would be the same process. Moving the article is is moving it to a new title. It's sort of a strange way to think about it, but that's that's kind of how the um, that's how the Wikipedia software thinks of it. A, a new page name is a move, not a, not a rename. Uh, oh yes, and Sarah asks, a, a redirect gets created automatically. Uh, so that is correct. When we, uh, if I were to click the move page button at this point, it would create a new page that carries all of that history, all of the edit history of Nether Zone's sandbox over to the, the new article and then on, on her sandbox it would create a redirect so that if someone else has seen this article and maybe made a link to it or bookmarked it or something like that and they try to go to it, the software will automatically redirect them to the new location of the article. Okay, so, uh, and I think another zone, I think I may have missed a question from you a little further up. If the subject of an article provides me of an image themselves, how do I cite or license the photo in Wikipedia? In it's actually Wikimedia Commons. Um, <clears throat> so yes, so this is uh, this is a tricky area. Um, let's let's take a as as you well know. <laughs> um, so I'm going to let's see. I'm going to pull up Wikimedia Commons. I'm going to pull up the front page. Um, if you want to upload a photo that you took yourself or that you own the rights to. Uh, it's it's pretty straightforward. In most cases, uh, all you would do is choose upload file on the left-hand side, and you'll you'll um, you'll get this nice wizard that walks you through. It gives you a a cartoon that explains the issues uh, involved, and then it guides you through step by step. You select your file, you upload it, and then it asks you what license you want to release it under, and things like that. Um, but it does get complicated. Uh, First of all, in cases where someone might uh, might doubt that you are actually the person who took the photo. So, um, for instance, if if a photo is um, maybe maybe it's a photo of a celebrity who is uh, sort of known for for being reclusive, they don't really show their face in public very much, uh, and it's a very high quality photo. It looks like it was taken by a professional photographer. Um, Someone might look at that and think, "Wow, that's it's more likely someone just you know found that on a newspaper's uh, web page or uh, in a book or something and scanned it in and uploaded it and and they've said that it's theirs, but it's it's really not." Um, so in in cases like that, and it's kind of a judgment call on the part of 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 you know millions of Wikipedians. Um, in cases like that, there is a process for verifying that it's yours, and that basically is. Sending an email to uh, to a, a group of of people who have been entrusted with basically the the, the right to make those judgments. Um, so people who have who have been selected that are that are experienced Wikipedians and that clearly kind of understand all the the issues around that. And uh, it might lead to a bit of email discussion in which you persuade that person that you really are the um, you know the person who owns the rights to it. Uh, things that might contribute to that are like if you um, if you're a professional photographer and you have an email address that has the same domain as as uh, as your professional website, then that's going to be something that counts very strongly in favor of um, you know that that it really is yours. Um, if it's if if it's something that's been published elsewhere on the web, then uh, they might verify it by sending an email to that website and saying, hey, we you know. We're just checking to make sure that you really wanted to upload this file to Wikipedia and that it's not someone trying to impersonate you. So um, that 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 process is um, let's see where is that most conveniently linked? I believe if we click on contact us on Commons, and I think you'd also get here on Wikipedia. Um, 
I, I, you know, these pages have, have changed around. They're actually, I think, easier to navigate than when, I've, than I'm, when I last looked at them, but I'm not completely familiar. So uh, I'm, it's going to take, yeah, okay. So I think this is where you, donors, and then this will tell you uh, you're donating a photo. No, I don't know. This is no. This is actually how to donate money. So I've I've clicked on the wrong thing. Let's come back to this uh, later in the session. Uh, I, I will find the uh, the appropriate link. Um, the email address I do know is permissions at wikimedia.org. But it's uh, but it's worthwhile to find the right page because there's actually uh, there are actually forms that show you uh, a nice format for. Uh, everything that you should express in that email uh, when you when you first send it in to kind of make it as smooth a process as possible. So, um, so NetherZone, I I know in your case, um, what you had are some images that are that are pretty old that are that uh, I think a couple decades old that uh, that you do have the rights to. Um, that you had you had already initiated the email process, I think, before the class started, or at least um, uh, pretty early on in the class. And so, uh, the, the, your your photos got deleted, and it, so it's it's um there's a there's a there's a connection between Wikimedia Commons and the the ticket system where these where. Um, volunteers do that evaluation. They're not the same site, and it's and there are different. There are administrators on Wikimedia Commons who are um, elected and basically entrusted to uh, to make quick decisions on the flood of things that are constantly getting uploaded to Wikimedia Commons. And then there is a separate group of people. Sometimes there's overlap, but there's a separate group of people who have been uh, entrusted with this sort of customer service role of responding to the emails and making that evaluation. And so what happened with your photo is that typically when something gets uploaded and is marked as being uh, in that queue, uh, it, typically an administrator on Commons will wait about seven days before they make a decision on it for that process to go through. But in a really complex case, sometimes uh, the, the email says the people reading the emails and going through them it might take a while to kind of get through it and 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 um, and be satisfied of the the ownership and that all the that everything's in order. And so what happened with your files is they they got deleted in that in between time. And I think you may have re-uploaded and then they got deleted again, which can be <laughs> really frustrating if you don't know what's going on. Uh, it's an unfortunate side of how uh, Wikimedia works. Uh, but the the critical thing is is to continue the discussion with the person in the email, um, who's the one who's going to make that final call that yes, uh, these these have all been uploaded appropriately and the um, permissions are all in order. And then the administrators on Wikimedia Commons are basically going to accept the judgment of that person and ignore any any file. They're they're not going to find any problem with the files in the future. I think you're probably still going to need a little bit of. Uh, assistance in working through that issue, and I'm very happy to continue with that. Um, but I think that's, that's probably enough uh, to share with the class for right now. So I will, uh, I'll, I'll follow up with you in email um, when I've gotten back up to speed on just where uh, your particular issue is. All right. So I'm seeing uh, I've, I've not caught up on all of the uh, discussion in the chat window or the etherpad. I'm going to just take a pause and look at the, the etherpad. Um, Peter, I, I'm, I'm, and, I'm here to um, help you yes. synthesize these items, as you know. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Um, Thank you. I think an interesting question that Maynard Clark has, has just asked is about how you know how you know whether something is in the public domain or not, and how how do things go into the public domain through other avenues aside from from this one. And it's a complicated question because it depends on what what media, right. it depends on what country, and so forth. Although I imagine there are a couple of general guidelines that you know quite well. Yeah, um, it's a it's a good question. It's something we've touched on a couple of times, but not really taken on directly. And uh, I think it's probably worth taking a few minutes for that. So. Um, 
with media files, with so on, on Wikimedia Commons, uh, things can be hosted there that are either in the public domain, meaning that nobody owns them, or things that have been explicitly released under an appropriate free license. So those are those are those are two similar but distinct things. Uh, if something is in the public domain, it's that's typically because they're 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 the two very common reasons for that are number one, if it was created a long time ago, so the copyright has expired. The definition of a long time ago varies a lot uh, from one country to another, and the rules around that are are, are pretty complex. I'm not going to go into uh, great detail on that right here, but um, but just as a general rule, a lot of in a lot of countries, it's uh, when the person who owned the co copyright has been dead for at least 70 years, uh, and in the United States, anything that was published before 1923 is in the public domain, and uh, and many things more recently if certain things weren't done to preserve the copyright. Um, the, uh, the, the other condition under which things can be uploaded is if they have been released under a free license. So if you own it yourself, that choice is entirely on you. Are you willing to release it in a way that it can be reused commercially, that it can be published on other sites beside Wikipedia, um, that other people can make derivative works of it, uh, you know, make modifications and republish those. Those are the conditions that are required uh, to release it to Wikimedia Commons. And so if it's, if it's your photo or your drawing or your sound recording, uh, then it's up to you to, to make the decision of whether you want to release it like that. Um, if, if you've found it somewhere on the internet, it may be that it's already been released under a license like that. Um, some sites like Flickr uh, do a really nice job of allowing their users to explicitly state what um, what license it's published under. And so on Flickr, uh, if you let me pull up a Flickr page, uh, I'm going to pull up the stream of my friend Eugene, who recently made the choice to publish all of his beautiful photography uh, with a license that is Wikipedia friendly. Um, so I'm going to just click into one of them here. I suppose this may take a little while to load on your screen, so I'll pause for a second. Um, and then if you click on the, the I button over on the right hand side for information, um, and then you scroll down you see this attribution license. So it's, it's CC is the Creative Commons logo, and attribution means that the only thing that he requires is that you give him attribution if you reuse the photo. If you click on that, it's going to take you to the actual wording of the of the license. So uh, I think that I'm going to leave it at that for a, uh, a general introduction. Uh, if you have more specific questions, please leave them on the class talk page and we can get into them but we could easily have an entire six-week course just on the, the ins and outs of copyright and public domain. So, uh, so I think we should move on. This is, in my opinion, the kind of thing you can just Google quite easily. I would just Google copyright and whatever it is. And if you need to know how it refer, re refers to Wikipedia, stick Wikipedia in the search. <laughs> that's, how, that's pretty much how I find my way into most things relevant to Wikipedia rather than poking around for them because I'm I'm just faster at it in Google than I am in, in Wikipedia itself. So, so Peter, I was looking at some of the questions that um, uh, people had put on the Etherpad before and some of the notes you'd made on them. People, we did say we were going to touch on the issue of how people might catch up. I can give some of my thoughts on that if you like, or we could do that in closing. Um, someone had posed a question about how to proceed when information they feel is factually incorrect has been posted and they change it and it's changed back, what what should they do? You suggested pulling up a uh, an, an example to do with the Caribbean island. Okay. Yes. Uh, so I think that's a good thing to get to. But I but yes, if you have uh why don't why don't you lead us into the, the general question of, of how people can get caught up. I think it's uh, I think it's sort of a natural thing in this course. We have so many different directions that you can go. Um, and different people are putting in different amounts of time, so it's not at all surprising uh, when people 
feel a little lost. So, Sarah, maybe you can give us some wise words to help bring it in. Yeah, I and if if you have anything to add, please do. I'm just going to put. I'm going to uh, suggest that people look at one of the course pages that has our sort of navigation tab along the top first. Um, I was going to. Maybe I will share an application. Wouldn't that be different? There we go. I'm getting it ready. I'm not going to share my calendar this time. I know that you all were hoping I would, but <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to just shut go. mine down. Am I no longer in navigator? Okay. Now that yours is closed, I'm going in. Okay. Oops. There we go. Okay. So have you got my version of February 2014? Hello? Uh, I'm sorry. I had actually, I, my desktop is kind of confused. Yes, I do see that. Yes. Okay, great. So um, yeah, that's all you're seeing right now is my browser education yes. program, our February page. Is the font size good? It's fine for me, but it might be if if you can push it up a little bit, it might be helpful for folks that have smaller screens. Okay. What's going to be happening now is the um, the banner at the top is going to lose all of its formatting, but aside from that, things should be looking pretty good. So I think the way that we've we've been trying to build as we go with this class. So that when we're done, we're going to have basically what is a self-paced version of the class. And that is part of why uh, Peter has been kind enough to build for us this banner um, that takes us you know, to our home page, which is where we are now. You can go directly into whichever week you want to. And in each week's page, you can just watch the video for that week. And many people have been taking advantage of it, and I don't, I don't know if any others have. But if you go directly into week one and scroll down, we have placed every week's video on that week's page right here. So if I were to click this, the week one video would start playing. So anything that you had missed that week, you could watch. You could also do the same with week two and week three. And you'll see the box for week four there, although it's actually not linking to the class right now. So um, Essentially, we, we we strive to get the videos up within 48 hours, and I think for the most part we succeed. And we try to include that link in our in our in our email. Um, the Etherpad is essentially a continuous string of the notes that we've taken as we've been going along. We do put this week's notes at the top, but if you scroll down, you will see that each week is dated. So. That's a great way to refresh your memory of things that we talked about and uh, uh, people might have chatted in IM about as well. And um, I also think that people, a lot of people have been using the talk page to ask each other questions. I don't think any question is considered a silly or stupid question, no matter how simple. Um, everyone is working at different paces and coming in with a different skill set. Some of you already had accounts, for example. And so, I mean, it's actually been great to see how many people have started using the talk page actively for all these topics. And if you're a person who has questions and you don't know what to do during the week, come visit this page. Uh, look at who is posting, what they're posting. We are eventually answering all the questions. And I believe also transferring over our questions and answers from Etherpad to the talk page, or at least I don't know. Pete, where did, where uh, did I was, you transfer I was putting this to? On the class page. On so, the class page, okay. Yeah, so you on the week three mm -hmm. class page is where, it, like, I, I copied and pasted all the questions and answers from last week. So maybe I'll we'll also put a note on here where where people can go to find the the Q and A sessions where we've got a lot of things already documented. But so that's a, it's all kind of roundabout. But I think that the I think that the primary thing is actually um, is actually um, 
the videos. I think the videos are the key. And that's that's kind Thanks, of what I think. You know, yeah. what, do you have anything to add to that? I, I think that's good. I think let me um I, I, I think that's an excellent overview of the the pieces of the course. Let me answer the question in, in a different way that might be helpful to people who are kind of having a, a, a different sort of um, sense of feeling lost. Um, it would simply be the Wikipedia directive to be bold. Um, as, as I think we've covered in the class, there's actually a policy on Wikipedia called be bold. Um, and the, uh, the sort of in a nutshell summary of it is if you see something that can be fixed on Wikipedia, do it. Um, and I, I think one of the benefits of having a class like this is that you do have a venue where you can ask questions if things get, uh, if, if, if things go in a way that you didn't expect. Um, but, you know, a really basic principle of a wiki is that there's really nothing you can do to break it. Um, you know, you, you might you might do something that gets you in an unpleasant argument. You might do something that, um, you know, that uh, that offends somebody or that that temporarily messes up all the formatting on a page or something like that. Um, but all of those are, are things that can be fixed. So, for any students who are who are in a position where you pretty much have been following along the course and you do know where the pages are and you've been watching the sessions, but you're still feeling like you don't really know what you want to do, you're maybe feeling a little bit reluctant to uh, to edit a page when you look at it and you think, wow, there's already so much information there, what could I possibly add? Um, I would just really encourage you to um, to just just give something a try. Uh, if you if you think something could be worded in a way that it's a little clearer, um, just change it. Uh, we've we've talked a lot about talk pages here and I think that I think some people have gotten the impression that there's this elaborate protocol that you have to follow. Um, in, you know, before you make a change to a page, you have to ask if it's okay on the talk page, and then if nobody responds, you're not sure what, how long you should wait for someone to respond, and uh, you know, and then you're just really not sure what's going on. Um, that's really not the true. The the that's that's really not necessarily in in um, in the vast majority of cases. Um, if you see something that would make the article make more sense to you, it's very likely that other people would see it the same way. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really best to just jump in and, and, and make those changes. The places where it is important tend to be on very high profile uh, controversial articles. So if you were to go into the article on Barack Obama and, uh, and and make a change without really thinking it through and talking it through with people, it's very likely that it would get reverted. It's very likely that it would be about something that's already been discussed and people are happy with it the way it is. Um, but even so, I would really encourage you to make that change. Um, if it gets reverted, it's not a problem. It's a learning opportunity, right? If you, if you make a change and then somebody changes it back, hopefully they're gonna leave something in their edit summary that gives gives you an indication of why they changed it back. Um, it's possible that they might be mad at you, but it's likely that they're not, right? I think a lot of people get the sense, oh, somebody reverted my edit. They must be mad at me. I must have done something really bad. And that's not the way that most experienced Wikipedians look at it. Um, if, if you're doing the same thing over and over and over again and they keep reverting you back, yeah, they might start to get a little irritated. But if you just make a mistake one time, it doesn't bother anybody, and it's an opportunity for you to learn how to not make that mistake or how somebody else might see it. Uh, it might not even, you know, mistake might not even be the right word. It just might be something that someone else disagrees with, and your position might be perfectly good. And then if you come to our talk page, we can, we can talk through how you might go about um, advocating for your point of view, even though someone else has a different one. So, uh, you know, if you if you if there's an article that you've kind of had in mind uh, that you that you'd like to see improved on Wikipedia, and you're feeling a little bit nervous about uh, about changing it, we've all been through that. Everybody who's worked on Wikipedia has been through that at some point, um, and I just encourage you to dive in and talk to us prolifically about what you're doing and how it's working on the talk page. 
or even on the talk page of the article that you're looking at. Dive in there. People will probably be delighted to engage with you. Or uh, even on talk pages of wiki projects that are in your subject area. That's another great way to sort of get involved without necessarily having to be bold if you're really that shy, which I think most beginning editors are. So, um, Sarah, do you want to you want to pick out another question for me to jump on, or if if, well, if I people, think I think you have actually, a good... before I uh, let me, let me just say too, I, I I think there are a lot of different ways of answering that question. So if people are still wanting to hear more about how to get started, uh, feel free to be more specific on that point too. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, I, think, I was thinking that you might have a good segue into looking at, at a particular example of a disputed point, such as the, the Caribbean island um, uh -huh. issue. But I do not know whose comment that was or what island. It is. <laughs> right. Okay. So this is something, this is from the Etherpad. Um, this is on the Etherpad. I'm going to... I'll read it out to you. My question is that I've changed wrong information on Caribbean countries, changed it, and then had more experienced Wikipedians change it back to the wrong information. This was a very frustrating experience where experience does not translate into accuracy. Okay, so if um, is it, did someone not sign this on the? I'm, I'm actually not seeing it on the Etherpad. Somehow my eye is missing it. Uh, it's purple, so it, it could be Jeanette. Okay. Jeanette has two purples. If she's still with us, I don't know if she is. I can paste it if that would be helpful, but oh, she's here. Okay. Yeah, so um, talk us through it if, or just give us a link to the, the article. If you, and uh, we, can, we can just pull it up on the screen and see the, um, the edit history and any discussion. Okay. Oh, so she may not have. If, it, if it's from last summer, she may not have a, 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 an example in mind. Okay. But if someone does have a link that they could post, where if someone undid something they did, or if there was any type of dispute, we could look at that. Yeah. Or if we can focus on that next time. Uh, the First Nation Seeker page, right? Okay, so uh, I remember this. This, this. Um, okay, Jeanette, that would be great. Um, so, First First Nation Seeker. This, if I remember right, I think this was a question of notability. Um, let's see. I'm going to just pull it up in my browser. Okay, so I think, Glenn, this was, um, oh, I say, yeah, Maynard, I, that's my fault. I, I am not sharing my screen. I forgot I had turned off the screen share, so give me just a moment. Okay, so that should be coming up. Um, but, Glenn, I, if I remember right, I think this was an article that, um, I don't remember if you were trying to write an article about First Nation Seeker or whether you were trying to use it as a citation in a – oh, you added it to a list of search engines. That's right. Okay. Okay, so this is a Wikipedia article that is a list of Internet search engines. And so you were – you were trying to add this one, which is uh, specific to uh, uh, web resources related to First Nations peoples or Native Americans, uh, which I guess would be depending if you're a Canadian or American. Um, and I, Glenn, you're going to have to talk me through this because I don't remember it clearly enough. Uh, I don't know if, if you have a microphone, that would be great, or if you want to just type in uh, what this experience was and how it worked out. I, I do have a mic. Can you hear me? Great. Yeah, loud and clear. 
Yeah, this is one. Uh, I was, as I said, I tried to add this to a list of search engines last year. I'm not sure if we're on the right page yet or not with what you, with your display, but it was, uh, you know, it was a fairly extensive list of search engines and with, uh, you know, some very specific uh, focuses, foci. <laughs> so I added this uh, First Nations Seeker search engine. And then, of course, there was uh, I tried to link to it, and there was there was nothing on Wikipedia. So I tried to create a page on Wikipedia for First Nation Seeker for the actual search engine, and the uh, uh, editors disputed it and uh, removed it. So I haven't looked at it too much since. I tried to find some empirical support for it, uh, in uh, especially um, articles that had referenced it specifically, uh, but what, what's happened is that lots of people use this search engine, but they don't cite it directly. So it was a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is, this, this is a, a, a rather common issue. There's sort of two nested issues here. Um, and I think people will probably encounter them in, in lots of different places on Wikipedia. Um, so just as a, a in, in broad strokes, uh, what's going on is that Lists on Wikipedia, typically the idea of a list is that the notability standard is is used to determine what does and doesn't go on the list. So as an example, um, if I were to create a Wikipedia article that was list of baseball players and my 11-year-old nephew is a baseball player, uh, maybe I would want to put on put his name on that list alongside, you know, Carl Yastrzemski and Jim Rice and all, you know, like famous worldwide internationally known baseball players. And so somehow Wikipedia needs to make the judgment that uh, that Babe Ruth belongs on the list and that my 11 year old nephew does not belong on the list. And so the, the, the standard way that that cutoff is generally made is if they are considered notable enough uh, to have their own Wikipedia article, then they get included on the list, and if not, then they don't. It's certainly not a perfect uh, way to to make that distinction, but it's one that kind of works, and it's 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 used all over Wikipedia. Um, so that brings us to the second question, which is, you know, is this topic notable? So is is the First Nation seeker search engine something that meets Wikipedia's notability criteria. Um, the presumption is that if there isn't already a Wikipedia article about it, then it's not. So if someone's looking at the list article and they see a whole bunch of blue links and then they, then they see a red link that indicates that there is no Wikipedia article, then they're going to delete it out of the list of the, the list article and say, you know, come back once you've written that article, once you've proven that it's notable enough to have its own article, then we can include it in the list. And, um, you know, and they see what they're doing as important because it's keeping Wikipedia manageable. It's keeping the list of search engines from including the, you know, the thousands of like high school projects to write a search engine, uh, you know, that someone just wanted to include in Wikipedia and stick in the list so that it's, um, so that it's actually somewhat useful to the reader. But then, that puts someone like Glenn in the position of, well, now you need to go and write a basic stub article so that it's a blue link, not a red link. And in order to do that, you need to demonstrate that it meets Wikipedia's notability. There are lots of, there are lots of topics that um, if you're familiar with the subject, it seems really painfully obvious that it's very notable, that it's, that it's significant. And Wikipedia's notability guideline can be a really rough um, standard to apply because it is kind of so general uh, because there are certain kinds of things like search engines that don't tend to get there aren't there there might not be magazines dedicated to them or you know the kinds of things that would general generate independent coverage um, so uh, I, I you know I I I think uh, you know based on my very hazy memory of it that first first nation seeker kind of turned out not to have enough independent coverage that it would uh that it would meet that notability guideline and so 
it may very, very well be that this is a case where Wikipedia policy uh, leads to a result that isn't ideal because it, it may be an important uh, search engine that just uh, that just hasn't been, you know, maybe just because the people who wrote it aren't in Silicon Valley where there are lots of blogs and and newspapers and things that tend to cover stuff like that, um, that it didn't get covered even though it maybe is used a lot more than, than a lot of the search engines that, that have gotten press coverage. Um, I can't really, you know, I, I, I think, I think when we start getting into those questions, it's sort of a more advanced topic than I think we're prepared to handle in this course. Um, certainly, there is uh, there's there's all kinds of debate around whether Wikipedia's policies are the right ones and whether they can be improved. Uh, and it can be very frustrating to to change them because you really have to persuade a lot of people. Um, but those are you know those kinds of of, uh, of decisions are, are a bit more advanced than we're trying to get to in this course, so I don't I don't want to go too far down that road. But but certainly it is a legitimate issue, and um, you know it may be that Wikipedia just has has failed to do what it what it should in this in this case. And we we kind of see these discussions play out across different different places in um, in Wikipedia. And if we had an example of a, of a recent discussion, we could just sort of look at, at how these things sort of track out over time. But you know, someone will before reversing someone else or when reversing someone else's change, it's not discussing it with them first on the article talk page or the users talk page. They will just often make some kind of. A, comment in the um, edit summary, and it can be quite detailed. Um, that little line <laughs> can be used to convey a lot of thoughtful information. Sometimes people will, instead of just reversing the change, give a, a very detailed explanation and say, please contact me directly if you want to discuss this. They may leave a note on your talk page. They may leave a note on the article talk page. Um, you can watch things go back and forth, sometimes even on a wiki project page. So these discussions are distributed. So let's maybe we can look at another example. I see uh, Randolph has told us about the article Lucy Stone. So let's let me pull that up. And Randolph, if you um, if you have a microphone, feel free to grab it and tell us a little bit about this. Or if not, uh, use the chat window. So he says, I worked on the article, I first worked on the article Lucy Stone and continue to watch it as it gets changes over time, including vandalism. So let's see, I'm going to click the view history tab so we can get a sense of what time period you're talking about. And I'm going to go all the way to the bottom. In the default view, we see 50 lines of history. So there have been 50 changes since June 2013, but um, since these are blue links here, uh, it looks like there are even more. So let's, uh, I'm going to just click on 500 and see if that brings us to the end. Um, my browser is stalling a little bit. And now if I scroll to the bottom, okay, it looks like, um, looks like this article was first created. Oh, okay, this doesn't even bring us to the beginning. So this was, so in March 2009, that was 500 edits ago, and it goes back even further than that. So this is an article that's existed for several years. Right. We've this is, um, uh, when I first uh, uh, worked with the University Press of Virginia, I was real excited about um, uh, how, how do people perceive Lucy Stone, because everybody kind of knows about Elizabeth Elizabeth Cady Stanton and so on. And so this was one of my early forays. I mean, this was actually um, the first time I ever created a Wikipedia account. Um, I ventured into Wikipedia. And um, it has just astounded me how um, uh, controversial she remains and at the same time so strangely hidden in, in history. Um, so it's just this, uh, a wonderful sort of um, case study of how important it is that we uh, think really carefully about what we're doing when we, when we write in Wikipedia because I don't think 
many people know about her, and um, as a consequence, I feel like the Wikipedia article is as good as any of the other stuff, and and kids will see this article. (laughs) Yeah, and they'll see this article. They won't see histories, and in their typical textbooks, they only hear about Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was a racist, and Laura Clay from Kentucky, and Lucy Stone early, early on was an abolitionist, and she pushed for women's rights in a biracial way that just was kind of edged out of the histories because it really wasn't very popular at all. So it's just kind of fun. And every time I look at the um, watch list, because this is my first one, um, I, I mean, it's astounding how often it's changed. So I noticed the uh, the good article uh, symbol in the upper right. Did you have any involvement in the good article process of it getting reviewed? Oh, I don't know. No, no. I I just came in um, and, uh, you know, added in a few things. Um, It was my first, you know, (laughs) try. So um, if we – let's just click on the talk page. Are there any sort of uh, discussions or disagreements that stand out as significant to you? Because we could look for. Is there anything on this on this talk page maybe that jumps out to you? Oh shucks, I could I um I would have thought by now I could think of what it was that was getting vandalized all the time, and uh, I think it it mostly had to do with uh, I think you're right the marriage protest and you know the concept uh, that she and her husband had about uh, woman as chattel. Mm. Yeah, so um, uh, one thing I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, one thing I'm interested to, to look for, because we see that it's, uh, that it was listed as a good article, it might be interested to look, if we click on this good article nominee link in the, in the beige box at the top, that will take us to, well, um, <laughs> usually to a, a rather detailed discussion. In this case, um, the person reviewing the article said this article is absolutely phenomenal. Um, so it's it's pretty rare that an article will simply be approved as a GA without uh, any discussion back and forth. Um, I do see this was back in 2010. I think it's maybe gotten a little bit more, uh, there tends to be more discussion these days. But usually this would be a good place to go and, and, and find some discussion around um, the the places where it was challenging to bring the the article up to a high level of quality. Anything more about this one before we move on? Okay. I think somebody had put another suggestion. I'm going back in the chat because I think I saw one before we looked at Glenn's article. Yeah, Chris. I don't know if this is a suggestion for something to look at. Oh, okay. So here's – so, Chris, I don't know if this is something that you were directly involved in or if you were just pulling up uh, maybe an example of something uh, very current. Um, but this is – so I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that this is having to do with the Crimea article. So uh, this is sort of a view of something very different than what we've been talking about, just straight vandalism. Probably, probably vandalism or um, or inserting something that's obviously contentious. So, if if somebody doesn't go to the trouble of creating a Wikipedia account at all, um, or if it's a brand new account and people are seeing uh, edits like you know just adding a, a, a I mean sometimes it'll be like just a, a, a string of word you know letters in all caps and they're saying you know. Bobby Watson is an idiot or something like, you know, you can tell it's probably a school kid talking about someone else in their class or something like that. Um, and it really has nothing to do with what the article is about. Often that will happen on really high profile articles. So it might be at an article like Crimea where, as we saw from Andrew's presentation, thousands and thousands of people are looking at that article and some of those people are vandalizing the article. So typically what will happen is uh, the, the edit gets reverted 
and then a note gets left. And the idea is you don't want to you don't want to block blocking people from editing Wikipedia is a is is considered a rather extreme step. So you don't want to do it unless it's really necessary. So there's sort of this assumption that when someone vandalizes Wikipedia, probably the, the main thing they're trying to do is just see if it works, see if it's possible. So actually some of these warnings that you'll see are really, they don't really look at like warnings at all. They'll say, hey, congratulations, your test worked. Um, you know, your, your test was successful. You managed to change the page. I've changed it back because I could tell it was just a test. And in the future, you know, please try to do things that are, uh, that are helping us to build the encyclopedia. And so there'll be sort of a, a, a gradual increase. If, if a note like that is left, and then someone makes the same kind of edit again, then someone will come back with a slightly more stern warning, like, okay, you've already tested, like, you know, lay off, you know, stop, stop trying to break things, we're trying to build something here. Uh, and then only if someone is really persistent would they actually get blocked from editing, and even then, Usually it would be, they're just, especially if it's an IP address, because you don't know, there might be several different people trying to edit, or hundreds of different people all ask, accessing Wikipedia from the same IP address. You would probably only start off by blocking it for an hour or two. Uh, and then if, if you unblock it a, a few hours later and the vandal vandalism continues, then maybe you do it for eight hours, then maybe you do it for 24 hours. Uh, but it's sort of a, a gradual escalation and there are these uh, these messages that people will get on their talk page uh, that, it, that try to explain to them what's going on. So I don't know, Chris, if that's uh, what you had in mind when you posted this. Um, oh, okay, no, you're, you're saying the actual comments. So, oh, okay, so, he, so this is someone who's not just doing simple vandalism. They're, uh, they're, doing, they're doing something and they're trying to argue for why it's, the right thing to do. So this is um, user Hawaii 50. Okay, so I've found it in the edit history here, and let's. I'm going to click on Preve to see what this. So we'll, so first, let's look at his edit summary. He says tag teaming between these two users is ridiculously obvious. I'll revert once and then report the two. So this person is is taking a very strong tone about. Um, about uh, about other users. Oh, I did not mean to click undo. I have not looked at what they did yet. So <laughs> fortunately, that doesn't actually undo it until I click the save button. So that's fine. What I meant to do is click pre for previous. Uh, Maynard uh, points out the word tag teaming might not be familiar to everyone. Um, it's basically two people working together. It's a reference to a uh, wrestling sport in the United States where. Uh, where two people are on a team and and when one's in where they're, they're taking turns and they tag to to switch so that the other person is in the in the match um so let's look at what the edit this person is trying to do they're they've tried to okay so this is a rather complex one to look at uh they're okay so they're changing it from an info box about a country to an info box about a former country and it looks like they're changing what flag is displayed. And uh, and so, I mean, I'm. It looks like they're they're actually doing quite a lot of things. If you scroll down, there are a whole lot of changes that are wrapped up in this. So I think what we're looking at <clears throat> is someone who's been working at it uh, for a while. They've been making an edit, and it gets reverted, and then they do more, and then it gets reverted, and every time they're they're trying to add in uh, all of the different changes that they that they made. <clears throat> this is not one that I can really look at and and quickly draw a conclusion about whether what they're doing is good or bad. <clears throat> but I you know I take Chris's word for it that this is vandalism. It's not an, at all uncommon to uh to find people vandalizing in this way, especially on a controversial article. It may be that um that this is someone who's uh uh, like you know, who who really uh, wants the secession to be successful and is trying to write the Wikipedia article as though it is <clears throat> when it hasn't actually happened, you know, or something like that. Um, so people can get very very contentious on issues like this. And yes, uh, as someone Glenn says in the chat window, uh, social engineering, it, people will really try to make the appearance that. Other people are 
the ones who are uh, who are trying to do something wrong. So it's it's very possible for people to use Wikipedia policy and their familiarity with Wikipedia to try to drive an agenda, and it can get very tricky to uh, to argue with someone like that. Um, Chris, is there is there more that you want to go into on this example? I'm I'm just kind of winging it here. I'm I'm saying as much as I can without really being that familiar with the situation in Crimea or or this particular edit. Oh, Sarah points out to me that we're over time. Anyway, I, we had gone past the end of class. I didn't even notice. So um, thank you all for the great questions and ideas. I hope that this has helped you move forward on your final project. And uh, if you have lingering questions we didn't get to, please uh, just leave a message on the class talk page. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody. And, and to, with respect to concerns addressed about where our Q&A on Etherpads Either pads uh, stay or do not stay. We are transferring all that content, so we will point you all to it. See you next week. Bye bye.